Hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of the video series produced by the Legislative Branch Capacity Working Group. I'm joined by Matt Glassman of the Government Affairs Institute at, at Georgetown University. He's formerly a Congressional Research Service Analyst and a semi-regular contributor to LegBranch.com. We are introducing this series to kind of do a one-on-one -on -one talk with Congressional scholars, experts, academics, journalists, and even members themselves to get a better understanding of how Congress works. So Matt, thanks so much for joining yeah, us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I want to start a little broad and on a topic that I know that you have an opinion about. Sure. Um, there seems to be some misconceptions about how journalists or academics or even just congressional observers at large talk about congressional power, especially vis-a-vis yeah. -vis the president. So yes. what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think what's going on a lot in Washington right now is that there's this general concern that the uh, congressional Republicans are simply falling in line behind the president and he's kind of whipsawing them into doing whatever he wants. And uh, you see a lot of people concerned about this. You know, liberals are very concerned about, oh, Trump power. But even kind of neutral observers are like, what is going on here? Why isn't Congress standing up to the president? And usually their evidence for this is something like a, a pile of roll call votes, and they'll show that congressional senators vote with the president 95% of the time. Uh, 538 has an entire scoring system for this, you can see. And I find this to be a very myopic view of how congressional power works, or how you should think about presidential congressional power. Uh, first of all, it's not clear who's leading who. Mm -hmm. uh, if the president takes a position that the Republican Party's had for decades, for instance, in favoring tax cuts, and then all the senators vote for it, why would you ever think that that's the congressman following the president? Uh, that's some sort of assumption that there's presidential leadership going on. Uh, but a bigger piece of it is that, you know, you have to ask who controls the agenda. Uh, one of the most important things in Congress is what's not voted on. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, typically, roll call votes only come to the floor if the leaders believe they're going to pass. If they're not going to pass, they tend not to come to the floor. So what hasn't come to the floor so far this year? Well, a border wall with Mexico has not come to the floor. No. Protectionist trade legislation has not come to the floor. An infrastructure package has not come to the floor. And these are general Trump policies. They yeah, and these policies. are the kind of things you might associate with Trump, but not the Republicans right. in Congress. And that what we'd be looking for if we really saw the president leading the congressional Republicans. What we do see is Congress voting on things that tend to be traditional Republican policies. Mm -hmm trying to repeal Obamacare, that predates the president. Mm -hmm. Tax cuts and tax reform clearly predates the president. And of course you had the kind of most significant vote of the entire Congress so far was the vote limiting the president's power over Russia sanctions. And to me, these, this looks like a situation where you have a congressional party setting the agenda, again, this, this second face of power idea, that it's not simply how you vote on something, it's what you vote on. Mm -hmm. uh, and the president kind of leading along. I thought during the, the health care debate, the president was kind of just agreeing to whatever they put on the floor iteratively. First he liked the House bill, then he liked the skinny repeal, then he liked the compromise, and now he likes Murray Alexander. This looks like someone following, not someone leading. So why is that then? Traditionally we're used to presidents, if they're not setting the agenda, they're at least actively responding to the agenda that's been set. Sure. They're active players in the policy process. Yes. What do you attribute the Trump administration's lack of attention to the policy process, or as you just put it, following whatever's on the table. Yeah, well I think, I think there's a couple things here. One, I think there's kind of a general disinterest of the president in policy details. Mm -hmm. uh, he seems to be the type of president, we've had presidents like this before, who's more interested in outsourcing policy development uh, either to others in the executive branch or to Congress. Uh, second, I think you've got a lot of incompetence right now in the Trump administration. Some of this is due to being a first year president. Mm -hmm. First year presidents tend to be weaker uh, on, on these sorts of things. The Clinton administration was a disaster in 1993. Yes. On the other hand, the Trump administration also is uh, radically inexperienced. Okay? The president himself has no government experience. He's surrounded his original White House uh, with relatively inexperienced advisors. And um, you know, there's a sense that they just haven't got their act together yet. On top of all this, uh, I think this is a generally weak president in a weak position. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you win a minority election uh, that divided your party, uh, pretty strongly in the primaries, and your public approval is low, you're going to have a hard time uh, cajoling members of Congress or others to do what you want. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we're talking about here with presidential power. Everyone agrees the presidency is strong. This is a person who has their finger on the nuclear trigger, probably the most powerful individual in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but compared to other presidents, uh, President Trump is not in a good position to exert the sort of influence that will get others to go along with him. He doesn't have the public standing to kind of browbeat people by going public. And his professional reputation in Washington 
the idea that uh, members of Congress are going to go along with him because they're afraid he's going to outmaneuver them and beat them so they don't want to stick their neck out, that's kind of a, a fantasy right now of, of, of liberals who are kind of paranoid. Right. It seems that you subscribe wholeheartedly, and I think you do explicitly, to the new step view of presidential uh, power. Yes. So what would you advise him to do differently? Is this something that's a function of his approval and that's the way it's going to stand? Or yeah. what can he do differently to either take a more active stance on policy or if he doesn't care to to at least lead the charge in creating policy that the a majority of Republicans can give you? Well, I, you know, I'm not sure what he can do. His skill set obviously limits him in some ways. I think he's much more conversive about tax policy right. than health care, which I think puts him on a firmer footing uh, t to be there and be helpful. I think at some point in the healthcare debate, a lot of the congressional Republicans were just wishing he'd stop talking right. about it uh, and do no harm mm -hmm. uh, to begin with. But I think, you know, the, the Newstat playbook w would tell a president, you know, out of the gate, rack up some early wins mm -hmm. to let people know you're a winner and that you can get the job done. And that hasn't happened so far in, in the Trump administration. I, but, you know, w what he can do now, I think, is probably try and secure victories over policies. And if that means cutting a deal on health care uh, that gets less than even what he had asked for, right. uh, that's probably worthwhile. I think one of Trump's big flaws is that he has very uh, difficult time backing down. That's right. And, uh, and where, where he could uh, you know, he, he get some policy victories would probably entail doing some compromising. It may, it may be too late for that this right. year. You know, I mean, how much time is there left before true election silly season sets in next year? Not that much. Right, and what incentives do Democrats to actually give yes. him those policies? Yes, yes. I mean, if you if you were, you know, if you were re rewinding the January 20th, the first thing you'd say to Trump is, don't do that horrific travel ban. <laughs> yeah. Right? Instead, so, start with an infrastructure package. The travel ban was more or less the worst thing, I think, that they could have started with. It showed off incompetence. Right. It showed off an inability to work with the executive branch. It annoyed people in the judiciary, in the executive branch, in Congress. It created chaos. It was sloppily written. And it really, it really highlighted uh, inexperience and incompetence rather than uh, strength and, and winning. Okay. So in addition to Republicans not carrying Trump's water, mm -hmm. do you see other conventional wisdoms about Congress, either more broadly or what you hear at the dinner table or from family yeah. and friends that are just, yeah. just simply not true? You're a former Hill staffer. Sure. You've seen how the place works from the inside out. I know I have to explain a lot to friends and family that are just obs casual observers. Like, that's actually not how it works. And you have to talk about more in the grains things like incentives of individual members. Yeah. So what other conventional wisdoms do you see not truly I mean, out? I, I think the, the, the most damaging uh, piece of common public opinion about Congress is that members of Congress, particularly in the House, aren't responsive to their constituents. Right. I think this is um, hor horrifically wrong. And in fact, I would uh, suggest that the opposite may be the bigger problem, that members of Congress, particularly in the House, are too responsive yes. to their constituencies. And, uh, you know, you see this sometimes. People, people will say the same thing. They'll say, well, you know, members of Congress don't listen to people on, on, on tax cuts. Oh, and also, by the way, they should impeach the president, even though 70 percent of their constituents right. disagree. <laughs> right? And there's this idea, uh, I think, floating around a lot of the public that Congress should just do whatever they want. And whatever they want not only represents uh, the right thing to do in a national sense, but also represents what most constituents want, mm -hmm. and, and that's just wrong. I, I think most members of Congress are hypersensitive to their constituents, almost to a fault right. in the House, and, and even so in the Senate. So, so that's one thing. Uh, I, I think the second thing that is, is damaging to Congress um, in, in presidential congressional relations is there's a sense out there that members of Congress aren't hardworking or aren't sincere right. people. And this is this is or more that they only spend time in Washington two days a week. Right. And at home yeah. There. And I, I think I think this is a a terrible uh, a terrible fallacy. Most members of Congress are working extremely long hours, uh, often seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And you know this idea that they're in Washington Tuesday to Thursday. Well, that's often true right. on the congressional calendar. But it's not like when they go home Friday to Monday, they're somehow sitting around watching football mm -hmm. games. Uh, often members of Congress would rather be in Washington in terms of pressure on their schedule. Uh, and the amount of time that they are in meetings or, or dealing with constituents in their district can, can really be a drag uh, and can really be something that turns people off about the job. Right. Because it will be so easy to be a member of Congress. Actually, you know, this is a job that is, has a real burnout, right. uh, burnout problem with it. Uh, and a lot of members, you know, walk away from it citing exactly that. It's not worth it. Right. Okay. I want to transition to a, a pet topic of ours and a, a lot of organizations around town. With, and that's topics of congressional reform. Yes. There's... There's no secret that Congress has an approval rating in the single yes. digits. At, it's at historic lows. Um, they're less popular than the New York football giants, which yes. is bananas to me. I don't get it. 
So it seems like, I mean, voters are angry, members are angry, increasingly you hear that leaders are angry about how the place actually works. Yes. So it seems like the incentives are there that we should all come together, mm -hmm. talk about issues that we're all upset about, and even find some common ground on things that we can actually make the place look, work better. Mm -hmm. So why doesn't that happen? Well, why doesn't reform happen in Congress? Right. I think it's, one, is because most people have this idea that congressional reform is going to happen uh, through reasoned argument mm -hmm. and sort of like uh, philosophical debate about how, how our Congress should be run. And that would be nice mm -hmm. if we could just sit around a room like this, discuss how Congress should be formed and implement it, but that's really not the reality of the situation. The reality is that any kind of reform you're going to propose that has a long-term benefit perhaps for Congress is going to be judged by members on its instantaneous uh, effect on public policy right issues. Now. Yes, and right now. And so short-term incentives need to align with long-term incentives in order to get, you know, kind of congressional reform that maybe an outside observer would want to blast in there if they, mm -hmm. if they were a monarch or something like that. And so you have to get those incentives to line up, and often they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you're talking about making structural changes to Congress, whether it's strengthening the committee system by getting rid of term limits for committee chairs in the House, for instance, or you're talking about strengthening the leadership by weakening the committee system, those might have wonderful kind of philosophical benefits or right. normative advantages, but almost any member who's considering voting on these, either in their party or on the floor of the House, is going to take into consideration how it affects their immediate interests mm -hmm. as representatives. And that's totally normal mm -hmm. and totally fine. Right. And so what you're really looking for is you're looking for the incentives to align. Mm -hmm. uh, last fall, I thought there was going to be a tremendous opportunity for Congress for a resurgence of congressional power because I thought a Republican-controlled Congress in the face of a Clinton presidency right. was fin finally going to have the incentives aligned to snap to and really beef up congressional power and really take on the executive. Mm -hmm. Of course, Clinton didn't win, uh, but I still think that uh, we're seeing some of that in that, uh, you know, this didn't start with President Trump, but right. the post-9-11 uh, buildup of the executive branch, mm -hmm. uh, both in authority and both in capacity over things like Homeland Security, uh, foreign affairs, the AMUFs, uh, is finally coming home to roost, I think, you know, 15, 20 years later, where we may have uh, President Trump pushing it over the edge and, and convincing congressional actors that not only is it a long-term good for Congress, but in the immediate short term, it would be good to start to reel in the executive. That would take Republicans going against a Republican president. That's, sure. uh, that's, that's so far over the edge that they are in a some sort of position that it's electorally more unsafe for them not to reign in the executive. Trump is so unpopular that they don't respond to him that then they must take action as an institution. Yeah, I mean, I think getting, getting members to, to think about their institutional incentives yeah. is, is very difficult. It's particularly difficult in the age of strict partisanship. But you can already see it around the Hill in, in a number of different instances. Of course, we talked about the, the sanctions vote, which right. is clearly an institutional vote right. against the president. Uh, you see it in... Uh, the amendments in the Appropriations Committee to get rid of the AUMF. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that was stripped out by the party leaders, but you saw an appetite in a Republican-controlled committee to reconsider kind of this blanket authority the president's had since 9-11 mm -hmm. uh, over the AUMF. And on specific issues, you've kind of seen it come back in a roaring way uh, when the administration through the White House said that they were not going to respond to oversight requests from committee minority members. Yep. Uh, Senator Grassley sprang into action immediately and not only sent a terse letter demanding that the executive branch respond to uh, all members of the committee, but really uh, laying out a, a really strong case mm -hmm. for bipartisan oversight and the need for the executive branch to respond to Congress as an institution. Right. So when we're talking about congressional reforms, there, we've, it's important to remember that in history there have been overhauls to congressional sure operations and yes. they've taken a couple of different paths one is the cannon style revolt yes. um, and then there's the most recently in the 1970s the Watergate babies and the and the pro transparency movement that that these things can happen it's not just pie in the sky that while the likelihood is probably low and the incentives are not aligned right now with how parties divided across chambers and across branches but the opportunity has been there mm -hmm. in the past and it is here now so if if we were to admit that likelihood is low, what do you? What option do you see as the most likely to <coughs> increase conform? And, sure. and and relatedly, we live in a world of limited resources. Yes. That, that this is admittedly not a sexy topic for members to campaign on. Yep. In fact, you can people candidates are running against Washington to be elected to sure. serve in Washington. So, how would you rank issues of congressional reform? If you were to fix one thing first, what would it be, yeah. followed by next? Yeah. And you taking in consideration the likelihood of these things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's two general impulses to congressional reform, uh, historically and right now. One is sort of the, 
uh, Wilsonian impulse that kind of has its wellspring in, in Woodrow Wilson, which is that the problem with Congress is that it doesn't resemble a parliamentary system. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that the separation of powers is fundamentally broken. And you can see this impulse uh, through calls to end the filibuster mm -hmm. and uh, make the chambers more majoritarian, uh, to strengthen the leaders such that the parties can develop policy, uh, implement that policy easily in Congress, and move it on through. These are streamlining reforms uh, that kind of take as a given kind of strong partisanship and even unified government in order to, to let the majority do what it wants the way it would in a parliamentary system. And, that, and that's one option. And you can you see this all over town and all over the public. The, they hate the filibuster. They hate committees holding things up. They don't like senators getting in the way, uh, particularly minority senators. Uh, the other option, which is the one I prefer, is, is to reinvigorate Congress as a uh, transformative institution. Uh, the problem with parliamentary legislatures is they're really just arenas where outside groups do battle. Uh, a separation of power system like ours is best when Congress actually uh, deliberates and develops legislation internally. Mm -hmm. uh, this has all the advantages of a legislature. It allows diversity of opinion, it allows full representation, and it allows an airing of political fights in a controlled environment. And so to do this, uh, the, the reforms I would look would be ones that strengthen the committee system. Right. Um, and, and I see that as two sides. One is kind of this resource capacity, uh, bringing in uh, more expertise to the committee system, better paid staffers, uh, and expanding the ability of uh, the committees to compete with other interests in the development of policy. Mm -hmm. uh, but second, it's a, it's a rules issue too. Mm -hmm. uh, right now in both the House and Senate, it's very easy for the leaders to bypass the committees. Particularly in the House, where the Republicans have slapped term limits on committee chairs, uh, no one really has the incentives uh, to develop a serious expertise as a chairman. Right. You're not going to be around long enough to deal with it, and therefore you don't end up with a lot of turf to protect either. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, the weakness of the committee chairs, I think, really stands in the way of this deliberation. And I think, you know, the main downside to this is you can see the, the parties trying to uh, legislate kind of quickly and secretively from the top down. Right. You saw it with health care, you're seeing it now with tax reform, and what it creates is these moments uh, that are all or nothing cataclysmic kind of showdowns on right. the floor uh, and, grousing on, grou yeah, and grousing on the edges. Whereas a deliberative process, you know, a lot of people hear deliberation and they hear kind of like reason sitter, and that's not what we mean. We just mean an opportunity for people to voice their opinion and amend bills to right. make them better and to get buy in from a wider set of actors before you bring these fights to the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw Senator Langford came out against the tax reform bill today. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's someone coming out against this early in the process. If this was going through kind of a standard committee markup, um, uh, which the health care bill did and the tax reform bill is looking like it is going to be a quick markup, right. we might get more of this kind of give and take uh, where the Republican Party could come up with a package where at least they were unified mm -hmm. on it. So you hear members calling for something like this, and increasingly so, often they are from retiring members. So yep. most. Most notably, we saw John McCain go to the Senate floor yep. and beg and plead his leadership and his fellow senators to get behind some semblance of regular order. Yep. That can take on a, ver a variety of meanings yep. for sure, but he was ostensibly calling for a, a committee-driven policy process, yep. right? So if, that is, if that's an accepted uh, want of the rank and file across both chambers, why don't we see that? I mean, they're, they have the numbers. What powers do leaders have that are effectively stopping that? Sure. Well, I think in a lot of cases they don't have the numbers, I think is one thing. I think that uh, given the kind of uh, distance between the parties and the relative uh, tightness of the ideologies of the parties, now this is obviously tempered by some fraction, fractures in the parties, right. but generally the parties know what they want and, and want to achieve it in the broadest sense. So does that mean that they trust leaders to execute on those broad wishes? I mean, I, I, think, I think the median member of, of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party right now in House does trust their leaders okay. to take them in the direction they want to go. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's in their best interest to have this leader-driven process. Right. They can be frozen out on any individual issue, but mm -hmm. I think in aggregate they do. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the majority party in Congress particularly when they have unified government, really, if they believe they can execute their policies and they know what they are, mm -hmm. uh, they'd much prefer the streamlined system. Right. They don't want CBO scores. Mm -hmm. They don't want committee votes. They don't want uh, open amendment processes. Now, one thing is I think parties can trick themselves into thinking they're more unified than they are. Yeah. Uh, and I certainly think that's happened to the Republicans to a certain degree on the Hill, and they may have benefited from a committee system. But uh, you can understand why the leaders don't want it, and you can understand why, why members don't want it. If, if, if most members of your party uh, want to repeal Obamacare, mm -hmm. 
then one way to do it is to just, you know, wire it up and hold the vote and repeal Obamacare. The fact that three members of the Republican Party didn't want to do that yeah. doesn't strike me as a reason to believe the median member all of a sudden is going to jump aboard right. some sort of um, return to a, a, a muscular committee system. Okay. So then what, what signal would signal to you, what, what would have to happen for you to say, like, this is a turning point in how Congress, the rank and file, creates their policy? What would a certain member need to come out, a non-retiring member? Yeah. What, what yeah. signal would say to you, this is real? This is well, I mean, I, 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 mean I, think, I think, you know, if the tax reform process fails, mm -hmm. I mean, what, one measure of this is the failure of policy, and uh, that's one thing we're seeing right. in the 115th Congress. Unified government uh, with, you know, um, workable majorities in both chambers failing to enact policy right. is something that tells you whatever process they're taking on isn't working. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that they have the will to overcome this. Mm -hmm. uh, like you say, the voters don't really care about right. this. Uh, but the voters do care about not achieving things. Mm -hmm. um, and presumably voters may punish the Republicans uh, for not achieving their goals. Voters on both sides, right? Um, uh, including Republican voters. But, you know, you know, these kind of reforms, again, I don't think it's going to be a change where you wake up and someone defeats the speaker for election and says, you know, we're going to do this differently yeah. now. Uh, certainly, if the Democrats were to take the majority in either chamber, I don't think they would be quickly saying, you know what, we need to go back to a committee process. They haven't even failed under a leadership top-down right. process. In fact, they may find themselves to be more successful than Republicans because they may not have the divisions they right. do. We don't know yet. Yeah. It's easy to be known. Right. Not. I mean, what, what, I would, what, what I would look for is a, is a relative disgruntlement among the powerful who aren't in leadership. Okay. Right? And these are committee chairs in the House. Mm -hmm. Right? People who are continually getting cut out. Uh, of power they may have once had. But again, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, plenty of people around Congress have more experience with Congress than the members. Most members of Congress can't remember a time when mm -hmm. the committees were strong. Right. Uh, so to them, this isn't a return to anything. This right. would be a novel uh, institutional change. And again, I don't think it's anything, I mean, one of the beautiful things and scary things about Congress is that no one is in charge. Yeah. No one can grab the lapels of the institution and say, you're going to do it this way. The speaker can't do it. The majority leader can't do it. Um, and so, you know, whether this comes about through purposeful action or kind of evolutionarily falling back into it, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you've seen some signs of it. I don't, you know, this isn't to say things aren't changing. The House Freedom Caucus, of course, uh, has been organizing on the floor as, as a means of obtaining power. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at some of their demands, some of them are process-oriented demands to reduce the power of the leadership. Right. Um, and people kind of talk about them as this rump group that's organizing on the floor uh, as a block, which they are, and that's sort of its own innovation. But if you look at what they're calling for, in some ways it is limiting the leadership's ability to control who's in charge of the committees and, in mild sense, strengthening the committees. If you saw a sort of a sharper edge to that critique of theirs, you might see actual, you know, outright calls for, uh, for serious rules-based changes that would strengthen the committees. All right, great. So I mentioned to some fellow people that we work with uh, that I was going to be interviewing you. Yeah. And I solicited questions. Some were serious and some were not. Mm -hmm. But <coughs> one of the common <coughs> themes across people mm -hmm. was they wanted to get your take on the committee structure. And you've talked a lot about it. And yeah. is that is that the most ripe source of congressional reform? So anything from how we assign members to certain committees, yeah. committee chairs, <coughs> term, term limits, yeah. or how about just the jurisdictional issues that the last time they were updated simply aren't apt for today's time. Yeah. I mean, well, I think that the jurisdictional issues are long-standing and largely intractable, and I think largely secondary mm -hmm. if the committee system is going to be uh, as relatively weak as it is right now. A stronger committee system might then seriously take up jurisdictional issues, but I don't think taking up jurisdictional issues is going to achieve any sort of meaningful as reform. It by yeah, I mean, I, I certainly not as, as your first thing. I think. Um, you know, there's a long-standing argument. You can look at it and see it probably in every decade of the 20th century that mm -hmm. the committee system uh, was not jurisdictionally uh, situated to handle right. kind of the contemporary concerns. That's sort of an evergreen tweet. And you, you don't can think have. it's worse now than at certain points? It, 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 it may be. I think, um, you know, it's hard to say. It, it depends what issues are hot in any given Congress, how much they cross right. overlapping jurisdictions. But really, given kind of the leadership-driven nature of the process, crossing jurisdictional boundaries is the least of the concerns right. for policy Sometimes right now. Sometimes it doesn't go through committee anyway, yeah. so... I mean, I think, like, you know, we talk about kind of leader control over Congress. And what does that actually mean? Well, for the most part, it means that members in the caucuses are deferring to leaders or assigning them responsibility within, you know, party rules mm -hmm. for picking committee members and picking committee chairs uh, and not getting in their way if they try to do things like remove committee chairs or bypass committees with bills. Right. Um, ultimately, the, the caucuses have control of these things and can change them if they want. As I mentioned before, kind of 
the Freedom Caucus has made moves towards uh, readjusting the steering committee in the Republican mm -hmm. Party uh, such that the leadership has less influence over committee chairs right. uh, and the placement of committee members. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get your hopes up as a perspective thing about this. But um, if it was up for me, I think the term limits are the first thing that should go on the committee chairs. Um, whether they can ever really put a seniority system back in place or whether you'd want to put a seniority right. system back in place that had kind of the power of the, the 60s seniority mm -hmm. system, uh, that may be leaning too far the other direction. But uh, in terms of a capacity, people talk a lot about staff, but I'd like to see um, some incentives for members to develop some serious capacity. And the first way to do that is to allow someone to be a committee chair for 15, 20 years. Right. That person is going to have all the incentive of the world uh, to not only develop an expertise, but to protect their policy area right. and become very influential upon it. The true execution of division of labor. Yeah, okay. I think that's right. So you mentioned <coughs> that, I mean, obviously that is a huge, that's actually the, the purpose of this work. Yes. Yes. It's, it's something that we care about about a lot, but again, the not not the sexiest of topics no. to no, spend no, no, more no, no, money no. on Congress. I yes. think one of the mi big misconceptions out there is that they're staffed to the hill anyway. They we spend so much money. They yeah. have a cadre of employees in the district and in Washington. Yeah. They don't do anything anyway. Why would we give them more? So can you talk about why that is such? Why the return on that investment would be so important? Well, I think that. Uh, for one, you know, uh, the cutting of staff in Congress, uh, which was started under Gingrich in 95 and, and has never fully, you know, recouped from that, was, was really done for sort of internal reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of symbolic of, of cutting waste in Congress. And it was also a, a leadership power play mm -hmm. to gain power for the leadership over the rank and file. The problem is congressional capacity uh, is a much bigger concern interbranch. These internal congressional politics of, of cutting capacity are, are fine to have fights over, but when you're doing this, you're weakening Congress in the face of the presidency, right. mostly. And uh, interest groups. And, and interest groups and other outside lobbyists. And so beefing up Congress isn't just a question of leaders versus committees mm -hmm. or rank and file uh, versus leaders, but it's really an issue of Congress versus the other branches. What role, how much influence is Congress going to have in an issue? You know, we, people think about the Constitution assigning different powers, but the Constitution doesn't answer questions like, well, how much money should we spend on disaster relief? Right. That's a public fight. And whether the president is more influential on in that or Congress is more influential on in that is going to be partially determined by how much capacity they have to engage in that sort of political fight. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, how I, that's where I come from, thinking about congressional capacity. Uh, now, a lot of people think that it's a matter of uh, staffing up more, building right. more staff. My first move, actually, at a practical level, would be to pay the staff more. The staff that we have, give them some competitive Yes, I, I, I think so. Uh, one is because increasing staff uh, numbers creates all sorts of problems. One is like members aren't really clear what they're going to do with more staff. Right. Uh, and a bigger problem is where are you going to put them? Mm -hmm. If you're really talking about increasing staff on the Hill, you know, 50% or 100%, so it's sort of like idealized situation. Now you're talking about building new office buildings, mm -hmm. and then you're talking about a number that starts with a B. Yep. Uh, the big problem with congressional capacity uh, is that voters hate it. Yes. Uh, they don't hate the idea of Congress being well informed, but they hate the idea of members spending uh, money on themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I live in Connolly's district in Virginia 11, which is mostly Democratic now, but in the past bunch of cycles has been a swing district. And mm -hmm. if you ever live in a swing district, you know, you can hear all you want about policy issues, but two weeks before the election, every palm card that comes home right. is, look how much money he spent yep. uh, on his own salary, or look right. what he did. And, and, and constituents just hate the idea that members of Congress are spending any money on themselves. Mm -hmm. And so members are loath to take any votes that show them spending any money on their own salary, mm -hmm. on their staff salaries, on fixing up the hill and anything like that. I was a, a staffer at Ledge Branch Appropriations, and this was a horrible mess. Trying to get members into the Capitol complex would be crumbling, right. and members would say, we got to do something about this, but ugh, can we make it really invisible so I don't have to show people right. I voted for this? Um, and so that's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. But I would increase staff salaries. I think. Uh, you know, your typical staffer on the Hill who's making uh, forty to seventy thousand dollars. If that staffer was making seventy to hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars, I think your base of expertise grows tremendously. Uh, there's a, an army of uh, very young and very poorly paid staffers on the Hill filling sort of menial roles, um, which are needed but aren't necessarily kind of the policy expertise. Right. It's that policy expertise role where the committee system can afford to pay a handful of staffers. Mm -hmm. Um, very competitive salaries, they really can't pay that second layer of staffers, the salaries that are competitive to, uh, one, keep them at the job right. as opposed to going downtown, or just straight lead. Mm -hmm. um, working on the Hill is uh, long hours and grueling work mm -hmm. and not particularly compatible uh, with a family life. Right. And so 
uh, upping the salary is one way to kind of nudge the incentives the other direction without, again, having to find places for people to sit right. or things for them to do. And that's, that's an important point, too, is that if we look at, there's a, a, a ton of surveys from staffers themselves that ask them, why do you leave so much? Why yes. don't you like what you do? And we get the common answers of, I could make more, more in the private sector as an interest yeah. group, a lobbyist, or, or some sort of consultant. Um, but right below those money concerns are always like uh, issues that are free and can be fixed. There's bad management in the, in the offices. Yeah. We're seeing increasing stories about scandal and sexual harassment. Like it's, it's not a, money concerns aside, it's not a great place to work. You mentioned long hours, grueling work, yeah. not a lot of attention, but right. is there, is there a, a space to devote more money and resources to actually creating development opportunities, career development opportunities. So when a staffer comes in, these are highly educated, well-motivated people that want to be involved in the process. Yeah. But they come and they start answering phones or giving tours or responding to constituents' letters. These are not what they picture a Hill career to be like. So yeah. what can we do in those early stages to get people to extend their tenures and develop that expertise that will ultimately Right. Well, certainly more money is the easy answer to right. that. I, if you look at what a staff assistant or, an, or a legislative correspondent is making in a, in a house office, um, it, it's it's scary. You yes. know, these are people who have to live in group houses in Washington with four or five roommates, you know, through their 20s in order to make it work. You, you require someone with a real dedication. Right. Uh, I, you know, and I think in general, it, it's going to be difficult to solve the, the personal office issue. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're working in a personal office, um, there's not a ton of room to move up. Mm -hmm. The chief of staff is there and the LD is there, but if you're a good LA, um, there's gonna be opportunities everywhere for you to move, even if it's just over to the committee system. Right. And so the, the members' offices are gonna consistently be staffed by these kind of uh, very smart, very driven young people who may not have the most uh, knowledge or experience on the Hill right. itself. Whether that, that anything can be done about that, um, in some ways, I, I think, you know, you need sort of a labor class on the Hill. Yeah. Uh, and we don't wanna kind of turn this into the idea that every LC on the Hill is somehow uh, needs to be well paid so they can be influential because right. they're so important to the democratic mm -hmm. process. But on the other hand, I think overcoming some of the traditional uh, decentralizations mm -hmm. of the Hill might be worthwhile. Um, one way members can uh, compensate their staff more without having to take these tough votes is by putting uh, more staff benefits off budget. Uh, this is a, some people might call this a trick, but um, it's there, and, and some programs already do that. For instance, uh, the member's uh, MRA, the representation right. allowance, doesn't pay for kind of the agency side of uh, benefit costs, like mm -hmm. healthcare and things like that. Uh, also, uh, some of the benefits um, staff can receive, uh, such as tuition reimbursement, can be centralized outside right. of the member's pocketbook. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can build up these kind of institutional benefits uh, which then would take the discretion out of members who have this over staff and may right. not give it to them because they're stingy or just plain mean, but also reduce the pressure on members' budgets to fund these sorts of right. things. Um, you know, even sort of, you know, t the, kinds of, the kinds of things uh, you can think of being as like tuition reimbursements or travel benefits or anything that you can put off book right. uh, to reduce that pressure on members. That said, I don't think there's a huge appetite on the Hill uh, to follow through on radically increasing staff or salary. You talk to any member off the record and private, and of course they'd love to pay their staff more, and of course they'd love to have more staff, uh, but the votes are extremely difficult to take, mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of you know the price of a representative democracy. Right. Okay, so staffing is by far and away what congressional capacity observers say is the biggest problem, or one of the bigger. What are the other ones? I mentioned this because sometimes you see Hill staffers with computers that were of not of the century. <laughs> they are dealing with uh, constituent service software that just doesn't facilitate true yeah. representation. What yeah. other things, what other, what do we not talk about enough in terms of congressional capacity? Um, well, certainly, you know, these sorts of non-staff resources are important. Uh, as our kind of, we also kind of tend to think of staff as that a uh, young kid grinding out in a member's office, but certainly the nonpartisan staff mm -hmm. is another way to increase capacity that isn't directly tied to these things. Um, Congressional Research Service, right. CBO, uh, things like that. But, you know, I mean, there's also quality of life issues for members and staff. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the strongest resources Congress has is experienced senators mm -hmm. uh, who have large standing in the public. And when you see senators walk away from Congress, uh, in order to take jobs on the outside because they just can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a capacity issue, and people don't necessarily think about it this way, but when Senator DeMint leaves to go to the Heritage Foundation, right. uh, he's still staying in the game of politics, mm -hmm. but you, you lose something there. And yeah. if people don't want to be in the Senate because all it means is they come here to town 
and listen to the leaders and eat lunch mm -hmm. with, with the party once a week, uh, your expertise problem is growing. And so, well, how do you make the legislative branch more conducive to members not wanting to run away to the executive branch as soon as their party gains the presidency? Well, one way is you can try and spread the influence out among right. Congress. And this circles back mm -hmm. to kind of a deliberative legislature. Mm -hmm. If uh, Senator DeMint or others thought that they could viably uh, influence public policy, mm -hmm. uh, they may be more willing to stick around. If they're going to see the influence somewhere else, well, then you're going to see a, a legislature withering in the same way. And that, the, people don't think about it as a capacity issue. Right. But a legislature where the members are unhappy there yeah. is a legislature that's not long for power. Right. right. And I think that what hasn't been talked about enough is that that problem is likely to increase at a faster rate. So if we have, if we're losing institutional memory in the form of long-serving senators, McCain's probably on his way out. We have Cornyn retired. I mean, we have, yeah. uh, or uh, who's the guy that's just retiring? Uh, Flake. Corker. Flake and Corker. Yeah. yeah. So we have these guys that are leaving. <coughs> these are true. Uh, right. People would look to them as statesmen or, or they at least know the processes of the right. or what it used to be. And you mentioned before that um, members being elected now don't have a, a benchmark to go back to of like, this is how so, it used to be. So right. wouldn't that mean then that this process, as we're losing experienced members and replacing them with non-experienced members, that this problem is likely to get worse? before? Yeah, I mean, it sort of seems like it does. I mean, uh, you talk to any, you know, uh, teenager now who was born after September 11th, and they don't remember what it felt like to right. be in America it's a before September 11. Problem yeah, than an experience problem. yeah, they, you know, they don't remember what it was like to be in America in the 90s. And so when you know when someone says something like, "Well, we need to get back to what, it, what America was like in the 90s," they don't even know what you're talking right. about. They can't return to something you don't remember. And that's true in Congress too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one, one place we see this in state legislatures that have term limits. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in California or other states where where members physically can't stay there very long. What do you see? You see increased power of the executive, you see increased power of interest in lobbying groups. And so if the Congress is self-term limiting because people don't want to be there, mm -hmm. then the same thing is going to happen. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think this thing can feed on itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we're not going to ever want to blame voters for replacing members if they want different policy right. choices or different people representing them. But if members are walking away because they're unhappy, uh, then, you know, you're likely to see younger members not try for that long career, and you're also likely to see leaders not decide that, oh, well, we have all these bunch of young members, now let's reopen the committee system right. and empower them. It, it, it strikes me that it, it does have sort of a uh, um, uh, self-reinforcing right. mechanism to it. All right, well, that wraps up all the questions that I have. I think we're both a little bit tired. Yeah. Um, where can people find your stuff? Uh, well, uh, my Twitter feed is the best place to start because that will always have links to my stuff, and it's at Matt Glassman 312 mm -hmm. Uh, and I'll always have uh, links to whatever I'm doing there or just working on Twitter. Uh, I'm right at Ledge Branch a little bit. I have a piece coming in Vox shortly and something going in New York Times Opinion next week. So oh, you can look for me all around. Nice. Uh, but check the Twitter feed, yep. The failing New York Times. Yeah, the failing New York Times. Right. It's fake news. <laughs>